all young entrepreneurs and first-time entrepreneurs and small business owners think this. If I could just get a little bit bigger, my problems would go away. If I could just make a little bit more money, my problems would go away. If I just had 10 more staff, they would help me solve my problems. And in fact, Jay-Z is right here. More money, more problems. That's just the way it is. You think that getting bigger makes things easier. It doesn't. It makes things more complex, more difficult, more pressure on you, more salaries to pay, more products to sell. All right, man. Let's do this. I'm super excited again now. Again, because this is our second time, first first time recorded. Huge interest, and I think it was really cool because, like as I mentioned, it was all around you know building a side hustle. So that's your entry level point, which is really cool. And then today's discussion about kind of that you know toolkit for business businesses to grow them to really scale them is going to be really interesting. Um. So again, super happy, man. And again, I wanted to say a massive thank you too because if it wasn't for you. I don't think I will be doing a lot of consulting. I don't think I'll be doing a lot of mentoring for young people that are coming through with their career. I don't think I would have put my foot down on my podcast to try to monetize it. I felt that I was quite slow to the game towards monetization, which is even weird to look back on. But now I've just tried to be a bit more, a bit more kind of focused in that way. And it's not always about that, but I think uh, your guidance has helped me tremendously. Uh, and I just say a massive thank you. It's helped other people tremendously as well. And I've no doubt today will be the same. Ah, well, so great to hear that. Thank you for the kind words and for having me back. And like you said, the first episode was about side hustles. This one is much more focused on business leaders and entrepreneurs, um, mm. which is kind of my happy place. It's the most of the coaching I do is with uh, founders in high growth businesses. So let's get into it. Facts. You've, just, you've, you've pretty much lived and breed it. So we may as well just kind of go even deeper into it. I want to start with a quote, which came from your new book, which I thought was really interesting. So your new book is your business builders toolkit. And the first line I saw in it was building a business um, is work of the insane done in the trenches, wading through shit, looking for a magical diamond that we can't, that we aren't even sure it exists and we're not 100% convinced we believe in. And that's so powerful because there's so much different things to you know unpack there. One, it's the, the workload. Secondly, it's we're looking for this unicorn company. And then lastly as well, we don't even necessarily believe in and i think everyone kind of doubts themselves what was it for you even even you know writing that what's your your, your thought process around that yeah I, that's so funny as i wrote that line i knew that it would be one that people picked on and and so many people have quoted that line back to me because it is really what it feels like like you're hunting for this diamond that is magical that you don't know is real that might be real that you kind of think the world should believe in um, but it is like you're wading through shit. Like it sometimes smells really bad and it's hard to get through. Um, and I'm kind of on this path at the moment where I'm trying to help people understand that entrepreneurship isn't only glory because a lot of the last 20 years since the dot-com bubble exploded and then rebuilt itself, we kind of have the Vaynerchuks and the nice stats and all these amazing entrepreneurs who have done well, but only project the good. And they don't really talk about the bad and the hard and the hustle culture and the burnout and the mental health issues. And that's what we're going to cover a lot on in today's episode, I'm sure. But I, I was thinking of those things when I was writing this particular book, because a lot of it is um, counter narrative. A lot of this book is um, about the bad advice that you receive, not the good advice, because everybody distills good advice. And I wanted to pick up on the counter narrative of entrepreneurship and building businesses. So that's kind of what I was thinking when I was writing that line. Mm. it's really interesting as well because like it's a fact that a lot of people will sell you that dream and tell you that it's going to be easy because probably on the other side they have a benefit so it could be like a course it could be coaching whatever and maybe they were good at what they were doing so like gary v in particular you know he was always publishing content he employed people to publish content with him and that was his kind of thing he figured you know it took him so many years to do it but for you, and even even for me, when I'm thinking about these things, it's like, if you're isolated in your ideas, you think that these are going to be good ideas. Then when you start projecting them to the universe, that's when you start realizing, okay, there's cracks, there's issues, there's breaking down. And that's when it becomes a stage whereby people walk away. And I've even felt yeah. that myself. It's just mm -hmm. so easy to just walk away from things. And mm -hmm. is it very psychological driven from the very beginning, do you believe? 
Yeah, I mean, even just jumping back to your initial comment about, um, you know, people tell you how amazing it is to bring you into the fold. Um, sometimes it's because they're selling you something, but sometimes it's just because misery loves company. And the uh, analogy that I have is parents who tell you that having kids is the best thing in the world, but they neglect to tell you all the shit that comes along with that kid, the constant fear, the constant worrying, the expense, the no sleep, the fighting. And then once you have your kid, they're like, ha! jokes. I told you it was going to be bad. Now you're one of us. And that's a lot like entrepreneurs. We like to have other people around us that suffer with us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that psychology is a big part of building businesses. Um, I, I've been very conscious about the people I surround myself with. I generally surround myself with people that I want to be like. So I don't have, this is quite brutal to say out loud in the open, but I, I'm going to say it anyways. I don't have B and C player friends. I have yeah. A player friends. And I've spent 20 years cultivating and curating the network of people that I spend time with because I don't want to spend my cognitive load on average and subpar people and people who are not additive to my life, but it's subtractive. And that extends to my family. Like, if I don't like you and you don't contribute and you're not positive, then you're out. And it's that simple. So I think we have to be careful of the psychology that we let into our brains while we're building things. Uh, and mm -hmm. you said something else there that's interesting. Uh, when you have an idea and you keep it isolated, um, you kind of protect it. Uh, the analogy that I use for that is it's like um, Gollum in The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> he keeps that <laughs> ring really close to his chest. and He doesn't let it out into the open and it mm -hmm. ends up killing him. And your ideas are like that. Um, showing the cracks in your ideas is a good thing. Helping it see the light means that you can refine it. If mm -hmm. you think that the first idea you've ever had in your head without putting it out into the world is the right idea, then you're wrong. When you get it out into the world, you don't know what the world is going to do with it. So rather get it out quickly. Let other entrepreneurs see it and criticize it and, and give you some feedback rather than protect it and then never let it out into the open. That's such a weird little dilemma as well, because people prefer to keep it as their idea. Okay. And then they want to like not test the idea. Okay. You know, we pay for everything. It's like they're willing to spend the money and lose the money versus get the criticism. And it's not necessarily negative criticism. It's just feedback to say, okay, maybe you should do this or you should consider this or the market is telling you this or the trend is going this way. So it's kind of like putting on the blinkers and saying, no, I don't want to listen to anything else. Um, that's definitely must be an ego and a bias thing. The how, the how that drives though. You know, it can I mean, be... absolutely. There's mm. so much ego involved in building things because, I mean, on the whole, op uh, entrepreneurs are optimists. We believe that we want to shape the world the way that we want to shape the world and that we can make it better. And there's a lot of ego attached to the world view that you hold and that you're trying to turn into the world. Mm. So... I often, when I'm coaching CEOs and founders, I have to remind them that ideas are meant to be knocked down. They're not meant to be protected. They're meant to be put out into the world. They're meant to be challenged. Um, and the main reason of this is your idea is not unique. If you think it is and you're listening to me right now, you're wrong. You might not like that I'm saying that, but nothing you have thought is unique. Nothing I have thought is unique. Everything is derivative. What this all comes down to is execution. Are you mm -hmm. able to execute better than anybody else? Because I promise you now, there is nothing unique. Uber was not unique. All they did mm -hmm. was take taxis and put them on the app, in an app. It's really not that unique. Airbnb took B&Bs and made them available to more people. It's not unique. It's just about evolution and execution. So the sooner and more comfortable you get with releasing your ideas, the more likely you are to feel pressure to build them. If you protect mm -hmm. your ideas, you're never going to feel pressure to build them. And then you're going to have this idea until you die. And I know this intimately because my dad was one of those people. I watched him for my whole life moan about other people building his ideas. And, yeah, and the truth was they were never his ideas. And that's a fear. I, like I, I, you know, 26 year old guy, I'm always fearful of, you know, the entrepreneur. Am I just thinking about things or am I putting things in motion? And I know you need time, you need capital, you might need resources, you need education. Mm. But that's my one of my biggest fears in life is that do I just want something or am I willing to put my foot down? And I do set these capital requirements myself that, oh, you know, 50,000 euro, I can chill out for a year to, you know, go gun hole. But that's just a crutch at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. It needs to be that, that element of, you know, put your foot down and just go really, really hard on it. You said something really cool about execution as well, which I think is more, it's obviously more important than anything else. But there's, I think there's two stages to execution. There's first getting up and actually doing it. So setting out a plan, everyone has a plan, it's all well and good, then doing that plan. But then it's almost at the stage that when you do do your launch, you get your marketing, your friends share it or whatever, that's when it only begins when it's like six, 12 months in the line. And I've really noticed that recently is the fact that 
I am fortunate to do a lot of consulting at the moment, uh, podcast marketing related. I wouldn't really say it's more marketing than anything else to keep, keep it vague. But for me, it's about keeping the cadence and rhythm and frequency and be able to keep that up. That's more valuable than the idea. And even like lead generation, building out that kind of pipeline. So I think that's the second stage of execution. It's the fact that you need to keep on pushing, keep on grinding, keep on going. And it's it's a demoralizing event sometimes. You know, you're looking at something and it could be Saturday morning, Sunday morning, you're looking at things and you're like, you know, it's it's not matching up. Um, and I think that's the, the reality on one side. But then the upside to me is the fact that I just think that I get a kick that I don't get elsewhere. And it, it's weird. You can earn more money in, in a different aspect, but I think, there's a, there's, a, there's a way that it ticks with me, and it could be similar to yourself as well, that makes me want to do it more, even though that it's going poorly at times. It's not, I don't know. It's a weird dilemma. Yeah, I think that that, that all makes sense. Um, to tie some loose ends together, there's a couple of people to reference here. The first is Seth Godin talks about this in his book, The Practice. The practice is the work. Like if you as an entrepreneur can be obsessed with the idea of the practice, not the outcome, then you're much more interested in doing stuff because the practice is the work. If you're waiting for the outcome to be perfect, then you are on, you're not going to produce stuff. You're not going to release stuff. You're not going to build in public. If you're obsessed with the practice and not with the outcome, you will release things more often. So that's the first thing. And that, that leads to consistency. And the second thing that uh, kind of comes off that is Jerry Seinfeld is famous for writing a joke every single day. He is good at what he does because he writes a joke every single day. I'm not talking about like, oh, recently, forever. Since he can remember, Jerry Seinfeld has woken up and at least written one joke every single day. Think about your own life if you're listening to this right now. What have you done every single day consciously to improve a skill that you have? Every single day. I can't think of anything. I personally, the only thing that I do on a daily basis is write. I'm a writer by, by nature. So I think in writing my podcast, even that I promote with a newsletter, my articles, I write every single day. What is it that you do every day? That's consistency. And this then ties into a little uh, exercise that I like to get uh, my clients to do when they tell me that they don't have enough time in the day. Because a lot of people will argue that, ah, oh, they're busy. And I'm like, yeah, okay, why don't you do a time audit? And a time audit is very specific. I think I covered it in my last book. Um, you, from Monday to Sunday evening, you allocate, uh, you account for every single hour of your day. So if you wake up at six, what do you do between six and seven, seven and eight, eight to nine onwards through the day from Monday to Sunday? And then you'll be able to see what you do consistently. So do mm. you wake up and make yourself coffee? Cool. Do you do that every day? Great. Then you know how you want your coffee. Do you wake up and exercise every day? Great. Then you're doing that consistently. So what are the things that you actually allocate your time to? Because I firmly believe that actions <clears throat> dictate your intentions, not the other way around. If you intend to be a good person, but you're actually an asshole, your actions dictate your intentions. So it's important that you figure out what you do versus what you think you do, because those are different. Yeah, and I've tried to be, even zone in on that recently. I noticed because, you know, taking on more things is fine because you can actually you probably probably learn that you actually ha you're able to take on more stuff now. Obviously, within reason, but you probably learn you can take on more when you reevaluate. And I've even noticed that myself. It's like, do I need to, you know, go to the gym in the middle of the day, or could I do it really early, or could I do it in the <laughs> evening? And then it's about, it's about trying to fine tune that. And I've just been trying to do that time time more myself subconsciously, like indirectly to this, and. I've kind of seen like, am I able to take more things on? Because what I do find and what I find with other people who are trying to build something in parallel with their career is the fact that they take on more responsibility in their day job and they'll take a step back off the other stuff. And even my partner even recommended it. You know, she was like, you know, you're getting really busy. You're getting really stressed. Are you sure you're able to do this? And I was like, yes, because I'm going to try to do two things. One, build some sort of systems and processes so that I can outsource them. And then two, just be able to just dial in my time a bit more. Um, mm. and that's kind of an area I want to talk chat about as well. The unprepared nature of business leaders or entrepreneurs. I know you've, you've wrote about this as well in particular. And this fact that I felt that I am quite, I could put my time into stuff that's not value driven. It doesn't bring me mm. more dollars or it doesn't bring me more benefit. I could spend, you know, fucking half an hour trying to edit a video, a video or something that doesn't have as much value as output messages. So maybe mm. from your perspective, what do you think has been things that people have been pretty unprepared about that they, they run into? That's a tough one because I think context is king. So mm. 
it, it, for me, it's about what you're good at. So are you um, fast at editing your video? Then great, just do it, spend 15 minutes doing it and get it out, it's good use of your time. Or alternatively, if you are really bad at it and you don't want to do it, then outsource it and get it done. I think the problem comes in when we think of ourselves as quote unquote perfectionists, which I, I don't believe in fundamentally. If you identify as a perfectionist, you're just lying to yourself. You just aren't able to ship and execute and get stuff out there. You are not a perfectionist because just waking up today, you probably made some mistakes that mean you're not perfect. So we put up these barriers that make us feel like we're these perfectionists. So we don't have to produce stuff. So we don't have to get criticized. And then we're like, okay, well, I'm just going to take everything on myself and micromanage everyone. And we all know that boss. We all know that leader. We've all been that person. Um, and for me, it's about identifying what I like to do. And this, this again, goes to all the, the founders that I, I reach. When you get to a certain level of your business, and I'm obviously not talking about the one person just fresh in a startup, got 5,000 pounds in their back pocket, and they're grinding to make it work. Of course. Then you need to be the expert generalist. You need to be the HR person, the salesperson, the designer, the developer, whatever. I'm not talking about businesses that are starting to scale and entrepreneurs who are trying to introduce more into their lives, you have to pick out what you are good at. You have to double down, I believe, on what your strengths are, not try and resolve your weaknesses. I think refining the things you're good at is more important than getting average at the things you're bad at because you can hire people to do the things you're bad at who excel at those things. And it's that level of self-awareness that makes great leaders great. If you don't have that EQ, you're going to think that you're the best person in your business. And let me tell you, if you think you're the only and best person in your company, you're already losing. You need to be hiring A players to do better things than you can ever do. Your job as a leader is not to be the best worker. It's to enable people to do their best work. And you can't do that if you're hiring B and C players. Interesting. How do you draw that line between like what you're good at and what you need? Because like, for instance, I would say that I'm very good at managing stuff. I would say that I, I, I'm very good approach towards clear organization management it could be a product it could be a feature it could be an aspect i would say that i'm not very ux focused i would say i'm not very technical focused but it's not to say that i don't know them does that make sense so in it does, that sense yes. in that sense it's like do i put my trio of five thousand dollars into hiring someone who's a you know a product designer or a back-end engineer and it's hard to distinguish what do you kind mm -hmm. of advise for people that are in those kind of particular areas I think it isn't actually hard to distinguish. I think it's hard to make the decision. Um, I think we all inherently know what we're shit at, but we <laughs> wish that we were better at things. So like, I, I mean, I'll speak directly with my experiences. I'm a very average coder. I'm a very average designer, um, but I excel at storytelling and I know how to lead. So what I need to do is focus on my 10X traits. You need to do the things that you are 10 times better at anybody else. Do those things because you can do them faster and better than anybody else in your business. The things that you are 10 times worse at everybody at will take you literally 100 times longer, 10 times worse to get 10 times better. 10 times 10 is 100. It's going to take you 100 points of effort to get to where the people you could hire are already at, then why would you do those things? Whether it's business development or outreach or whatever, it is, it's in the lack of self-awareness that I think leaders like that struggle because they think that they're 10 times better at something. And it's that self-awareness that I think is where most leaders need to start excelling. EQ is the new IQ. The soft mm -hmm. skills are the new hard skills. Those are the things that we need to focus on as leaders and entrepreneurs is being self-aware enough to know I'm really bad at this. I'm going to hire somebody and then I'm going to get going. And the, the way that I really cemented this in my head was when I started looking to hire an assistant. What I did for three months, put a spreadsheet on my desktop. And every time I did anything in my day that I didn't want to do ever again, I just added it to the spreadsheet. And for me, anything I don't want to do means I'm kind of not good at it. Like things that I'm good at, I love doing. I like I thoroughly enjoy writing because I'm good at it. I like to tell stories because I'm good at it. So I do those things. I don't like booking meetings. I don't like paying clients. I don't like sending quotes and invoices. Those things I'm not good at and they are waste of, wasteful to my time. They also don't directly correlate to income. <clears throat> so as a, a founder, you need to figure out what are you 10x better at and what directly leads to income in the early stages of your business. Then hire or outsource everything else. Mm. it's very interesting you said they're very closest towards like revenue and whatnot as well because you could get caught up in those medial tasks sending out payments or booking meetings is a mm -hmm. typical one like 
how many times you put a, a, even like a simple, simple meeting in a calendar. It's just a small mistake and you have to go back on it. You're sending follow-up emails. These are just things that just buy time into. And I actually yep. have time in my calendar in the morning, would you believe, for exactly this stuff, going through things logically. And I always think I'm like, you know, the scale, even like a podcast, for instance, I see some guys recording two, three times a week, for instance, and they're making a lot of money doing it. The reason why they're able to do two, three sessions a week is not because they're editing two or three videos. It's not because they're sending out messages. Their agent speaking to a different agent. And, you know, it's simple ex examples like that. And mm -hmm. that's when I think a lot of people will potentially fail. And then they'll give up because they're like, there's a shitload of work involved. Like you're building a business, building an e-commerce store, or you're building a software company. You're like, sure, how can I do all this stuff? You know, because I don't have the time for it. Where it's like, okay, maybe you could start doing some outsourcing. Maybe you could start doing some basic stuff. Um, and maybe that's the point then where overwhelm hits in. And then it's just, mm. okay, let's take away. Let's, let's park it for now. And parking it for now means you're never coming back to it. And look, it's a difficult thing, I think, with the points that you raise, because entrepreneurs are generally, uh, the phrase that I, I've come across is expert generalists. So they have a w very wide level of ability with a deep, specific level of interest. That means that most of the entrepreneurs I know could do everything in their company. And that's where the problem lies. They could, but they shouldn't. And it's very difficult to have that level of self-awareness to understand what parts of your business you should dig into and what parts you should avoid and outsource. And again, I go back to it's that level of self-awareness. And most entrepreneurs that I start working with, they just don't understand that self-work is where this begins. That grind, that A-type uh, aggressive brute force energy only gets you so far. After that point, and the example in my head is like the Travis Kalanick Uber story, his brute force gift and talent, his technical skill got him to be where they were. But there was a point at which he was not the right leader for that company, regardless mm -hmm. of all the, the rubbish that was written about him, whatever. He just, he didn't have the skills to take the business to the next level. And you have to have a level of self-awareness to go, actually, this is bigger than me. And in my own example, uh, I've realized that I am a zero to one guy. I'm not a one to 10,000 guy. I don't care about having a thousand employees or a billion dollar business. That's not what interests me. I enjoy the no product to product market fit. That's what the game that I play. So why would I then take on a job as the CEO of a 300 person company? I would suck at that because it's not what I want to do. It's not what I'm good at. Why is it that you don't actually want to scale a company? And I've, I've thought about this myself several times as it, from your example. So you, you mentioned to me, you've done this for three, three different companies. Why is it you put a stop on it at that point? Because for most people, that's the glory run then. That's the victory lap because it's gotten to the stage and you've done a series B and a series C and now you're on to a sale. You know, mm. what, why is that? Um, because I know myself and uh, having built businesses since I was 16, that's now 22 years uh, in May, you kind of start to realize that there are parts of a business that are glorified but not fun. Um, and and they're glorified but not fun to me. So I know people who are people leaders. They like to lead massive groups of people, get from 1,000 to 5,000. I've had an investor who scaled a business from 300 to 4,000 people. That, that is not interesting to me. I don't want to puppet master people and hire groups and mix them together. I want to take something that didn't exist in the world, introduce it to the world, and gain traction. Then I want to leave because I want to introduce something that didn't exist into the world, into the world. So it's, again, that word, that self-awareness. I know that my skill set and my interest lies in zero to one. So pushing it, the glory days, and this goes back to glorifying entrepreneurship and all the rest. Why are unicorn companies glorified? Because the myth, the myth that I think we perpetuate is, and, and all young entrepreneurs and first-time entrepreneurs and small business owners think this. If I could just get a little bit bigger, my problems would go away. If I could just make a little bit more money, my problems would go away. If I just had 10 more staff, they would help me solve my problems. And in fact, Jay-Z is right here. More money, more problems. That's just the way it is. You think that getting bigger makes things easier. It doesn't. It makes things more complex, more difficult, more pressure on you, more salaries to pay, more products to sell. And I don't like that idea of more. I'm trying to find the framework for enough. Mm. And it's funny because your approach is probably more profitable. A lot of these co companies will take on much more people. They're going to be unprofitable for, what, five, 10 years, if even they get to that point. So I know the CEO yeah. will take the salary, whatever, but, it, but it's an interesting concept because it's not like, 
I always think it's so funny, and this is the way the, the VC culture is just hilarious, is the fact that you don't actually get the money and you're not actually richer. You just <laughs> you just have the work that's just started and you're just have you're under yeah. more pressure. So it, yeah. it's interesting, you know. Uh, Spot on. And I mean, I've got a couple of things to add on to this. Uh, the first is raising funding is not a success. Raising funding is another form of debt. You, you have to pay that money back in some way or another, whether it's equity, whether it's sweat capital, whether it's profit and returns, 10x in five years. I mean, if you think about that, if you're raising two million pounds and you're expecting a 10x return in five years, your growth has to be absolutely astounding to give your VC back 20 million on their 2 million. And in fact, that's 20 million, like actually it's 22 million so they can get the initial bit. It's just, mm -hmm. it's astounding. There's so much pressure involved in that, that it's glorified incorrectly. Founders mm -hmm. don't take money off the table at Series A. They just don't. They pay themselves normal salaries at Series A and then maybe Series B and C, cool, maybe they'll exit some of their, their equity. But most of the time they're either getting diluted or just holding on like like heaven for their equity to invest at some point. That's the first thing. The second thing is I was recently in Italy for a conference that was the complete opposite of this conversation. It was a conference for indie founders, founders that are independent from funding that are trying to get profitable are trying to build slow growth businesses. And when I say slow growth, I mean like 10 to 15% per annum. That's pretty decent growth. If you're a profitable company, you own equity, you own the business, you make the decisions, you grow at your rates. And the phrase that I wrote down here and prep for this interview is growth for the sake of growth is bad. That's one of the myths that we need to misunderstand, that we need to bust because it's misunderstood. There is something called catastrophic growth, growth that is so big that it breaks your back. And most businesses will experience that catastrophic growth because they're not prepared for what $200 million does to their bank and what it does to their team. And there's so many examples of businesses raising too much money and collapsing when instead they could have had a $10 million profitable business, but they wanted a billion dollar unicorn because it looks cool. I'm not up for that, man. Yeah. It's interesting, man, because like growth is exhausting and it's actually draining because it's just, someone's going to be just a hamster wheel and you're just, it's always going it's full speed ahead and there's never yeah. a let up. And that's where yeah. it becomes, it's not like you get to a place and I always compare it to sport. When you were younger, if you're playing football, whatever, you work really hard up until the championship. If you get to the final, you get to the final. And if you win it, you spend three months off. That doesn't yeah. happen in the career context, you know, anymore. Yeah. It's just weird. It's just constantly going until you leave or whatever. And especially if it's the founder, they're locked in. And I've, I've heard some catastrophic examples of people being locked into equity and then not being able to leave so there's yeah there's also those considerations you know all the equity going to zero right yeah. and i think that the, the point here is your, your analogy is so spot on if your only goal is growth then when does it stop when what when is when is enough enough like in, in terms of and like it's shifting this conversation slightly to success if your only measurement of success is money then when is enough enough like, how do you know that you've just, oh, okay, cool, 200 million pounds, 300 million pounds. When is enough? When is it? When is that number? So we have to start reframing how we look at our own versions of success and growth and happiness and life. And it's not a conversation that I hear often enough when we talk about business and founders is happiness. Like, I know a lot of very, very unhappy founders. I used to be an unhappy founder. And they're founders who've got Series C locked in, 200 million in the bank. They're driving their crazy cars, but they're very unhappy. And we don't factor in happiness to the idea of being an entrepreneur enough. And I, I'm trying to shift that narrative because your definition of success should include day-to-day -day happiness. And if it doesn't, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, 100%. And there was actually even a Gary Vee example of that even recently who would be the opposite. He was saying that, you know, a lot of these guys, it's is like when you're at 70,000 USD in your salary, you're like, fuck, I wish I was that founder. I wish I was the guy, you know, maybe I'm good enough to do it. Maybe I'm good enough to do it. But it's the guys that are driving around the Lamborghinis and the, and the Bugattis that are miserable because it's probably the only time they've been out all day because they're 16 hours inside an office, um, as well as just being, you know, the knock-on effect of that or whatever. So it's almost as if like you're always looking for something and they're being like, I'm wrapped up in so much stuff I can't even get out of it. All I have to show for it is this care that I'm not even trying to flaunt. I'm not even trying to flaunt yep. it sometimes. They're just trying to actually enjoy their time out of, of work, which, which was really, really weird to observe because it's like we're now at a stage whereby we nearly have the information to tell us that like, getting to that stage is not, is not good enough. But again, mm -hmm. it's about finding that, that kind of pattern. And these are those kind of common misconceptions that people kind of have, you know, and, and I'm all yep. for 
doing things and this is why our first podcast went really well because I asked you a lot as well a lot about how do you find something that's the longevity that you want to do on the side that you really enjoy and I think people are finding those similarities of what finds them you know happiness and fulfillment and joy and doing that because if you're doing something that's bringing you a couple of thousand euro in revenue or something that were listening to the show that's much more substantial than breaking literally every bone in your body to try you know just survive in a in a particular startup so yeah it's, it's difficult I mean, man Absolutely. And as a thought experiment, uh, just for your listeners and viewers, think about your own experience of life right now. Would you rather have a business that is on its way to a billion dollars, but you have to work 20 hours a day, seven days a week for the next six years to get there, or have a $10 million business that generates a million dollars in profit every year and you only work four hours a day? Mm. Like You can debate this until the cows come home, but I will take four hours a day of work every single time if it's a million dollars of profit every year and I get to declare a dividend that I put in my back pocket, why would I go and raise funding? Why would I try and sell that business? I would want to milk that business forever if I could. And the great example of this is the Basecamp guys. Given they raised some funding from uh, Jeff Bezos a while ago, 10 years ago or so, but they've never raised another cent and they've got a profitable business that they get to tell their staff how it works, when it works, when they want to do whatever they want to do. That sounds like the dream to me. Why do we keep marching upwards towards more funding, more money, more everything when you can get profits and just be happy forever? Yeah, it's cool. It's a cool concept. I want to take a little slant into uh, the world of chaos. And, and you, you speak mm. about chaos a lot. I think you mentioned to me as well before, and I have another quote as well that I want to reference. So you mentioned entrepreneurs know how to suffer. Trust me. People who know that shit goes wrong all the time. People who understand that the world is not in chaos. The world is chaos. So from that, I kind of wanted to ask you about, firstly, the concept of chaos and how have you seen founders, employees, leaders react to chaotic events? On the whole, um, not well. Humans like stability. We like to have predictability. And on the whole, most people like certainty. Um, but over the last two and a half years with COVID the way it is, obviously nothing has been certain. The only thing that has been certain is chaos. And we're just seeing this knock on with the war in the Ukraine, um, with Africa and the emerging markets being disrupted and disrupting the world. There is nothing certain except for entropy. Uh, the world, the universe, just on a very systemic and physics basis is pulling apart all the time. Entropy exists and that leads to chaos. Things smash together. Like we are one asteroid away from the, the earth being not here. And I kind of thrive in that thinking that uh, it, it adds to my nihilistic worldview that there is nothing after what we experience day to day. And if that's the case, then what we experience day to day is the only thing that really matters. And that applies to your businesses. Work on things that you want to work on. Solve problems you want to solve because there might not be a problem to solve tomorrow. And the people that I've seen thrive the most throughout the last two and a half years are basically entrepreneurs because they're used to the concept of chaos. We're used to the fact that our best employee will resign one day and will win the biggest client of our lives the next. That is chaos. And if you are unused to, or if chaos is unusual to you, then you better start figuring out how to make it comfortable because there is nothing other than chaos. Mm, that's really interesting. How do you plan for that then? Because like, let's say for you and you're building those businesses and you're, and you're looking to build like a one person business, whatever, and you're focusing on your next immediate task, is it what brings you revenue? Is what brings you potential sales, potential pipeline? How do you plan around that chaos? I'm going to stick with the macro philosophical perspective on this. Um, and I do a keynote uh, at businesses that focuses on the idea of curiosity. So I think there's a lot of talk right now about innovation and how we need to innovate our ways out of problems. And there is something very fundamental that I think is problematic with that. Um, innovation is not an action. It is not a verb. Innovation mm. is a noun. It's an outcome. It's something that happens at the end of a lot of other things that happened first. And the phrase that for me, the, the trait that helps me prepare for chaos is curiosity. It is a very obvious thing to say, but for me, curiosity is the God particle of innovation. It's the God particle of stability. The more curious you are about the things you're experiencing, the more likely you are to be prepared about them. So 
let's use a good example. If you are not curious about cryptocurrency, then you are probably not prepared for the chaos it's going to bring you because it is going to come and you can choose to ignore it and not be curious about it, not be interested in it, or you can choose to have a light curiosity about it and read one article a week about NFTs or Web3 or whatever. And it's your choice to be curious about the things that might disrupt you or you cannot be curious and you can stick with the status quo and you can let the legacy arrive and kill you because you refuse to be curious about the future that's in front of you. So I think that the antithesis of chaos is curiosity. If you are just engaged in being curious about the world around you, it's very likely that nothing will be unexpected. And when unexpected things arrive, you have the ability to be curious to figure them out and solve them. Mm. What's cool with that curiosity as well is that that leads to the potential opportunities and finding out, you know, like, benefits to this particular outcome which most people don't focus on funny you mentioned around even the crypto because the initial um perspective is oh no push out you know like be negative about it push back on it people don't like accept it and i, I remember even in particular when this when this kicked off last say six months especially web 3.0 i tried to flick my brain deliberately to be like okay let's not just say it's bullshit let's try to sit down let's try to look at it logically let's look at who are the big players? Let's see what's happening and see those patterns and behaviors and how these things merge together. Um, that was trying to be the focus. Whereas traditionally, I think when I was younger as well, you'd have that like negative perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's what an entrepreneur will do. It will be, we'll just see these behaviors and logical steps and see how they can make a benefit from it. Not necessarily necessarily make a profit from it, but make something that's a beneficial outcome. And that's a perfect yeah. example. Because I'm definitely behind you on the innovation stuff. And I used to hate when I heard big companies say it because it just made no sense that they're like innovating. It's like, yeah. well, what does that actually mean? A couple yeah. of guys that are paid in a research lab to read papers and write yeah. documents or something. That's not innovation. You know what I mean? Yeah. When, when I do this uh, keynote for leaders in big organizations, the question that I ask them is, what do you expect your team to do in an innovation workshop? to use words that didn't exist yesterday, to think of ideas that just popped into their brains that are brand new, because the literal definition of innovation is to introduce something new. But mm -hmm. how do you sit in a room and innovate? You don't. It is an outcome after many, many weeks, months, years of being curious about the world around you. And the framework that I have is, uh, and especially in the kind of thinking you were just talking about is, you have an area of interest and an area, of, sorry, you have an area of authority and an area of interest. And you need to find the intersection between the things you are an authority in and the things that interest you. So if you are interested in the financial world, you're an investment banker, and you are not curious about cryptocurrency, then your authority, your financial interest, is not intersecting with your actual interests. And that's a problem. So we have to empower our teams, our colleagues, our co-founders to express their authority in lines of new interest. And those intersections make people interesting. And if you can smash together your authority and your interests, you're more than likely going to come up with something that is combative to this idea of stagnation, to the idea that there is chaos. You're not scared of chaos if you're curious about it. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, it's about sticking with those as well, I think, because if you stick with your plan, you try, you try to learn a bit more about it, the curiosity in nature, then with something that's new, you get better on it and you learn about it. And I think the concept of even, even like YouTube is a perfect example. People that are publishing educational videos, you'll often see that the early videos are absolute dog shit. And then mm -hmm. as months go on, as years go on, they see the improvement, they see the better, how it works, the time length of it. And it, it ends up being this like great product. Same with, you know, it could be crypto, it could be an actual, your, your thesis of an actual building a product. But see, you often don't really see V1, V2, V10 with a company's products. You're only seeing where it's at now, where it's raised or whatever. So it's a... It's, like it's an already thing. absolutely, and it's a nice tie into us earlier talking about consistency and practice. Like, mm -hmm. if you are curious and obsessed about something, you're going to want to practice it more, learn about it more. And once you practice and learn about it more, you get better at it. The 10,000 hours rule that only applies to deep work not to random practice. Like it's about going deep into something and you only go deep into something when you're curious about it and you become obsessed with it. So it's a, yeah. it's a nice uh, segue that you got there. What, and one thing as well to observe is the fact that you can do new things. And I've even noticed this recently as well. Like I just 
I've kind of been working a bit more on video production and I'm very like fascinated by it. And then I always think in the back of my head, should I stay in my lane? Should I stay in my lane? You know, I'm recording all these other podcasts and it's like, no, let yourself try new things. And yeah, you, you can be a niche person. And I do believe to, to grow something, it has to be specific and solve a user need, but you can also just do other things too. <laughs> you know, it's, it's you that know? cross section. I mean, for me, a great example is I wanted to learn how to solve a Rubik's cube. So I did. I spent three weeks watching a YouTube video and now I can solve a Rubik's Cube. That has absolutely no material value to anything that I do <laughs> other than I was curious about whether I could do it or not. Like, mm -hmm. that's it. That's okay too. It doesn't have to be this deep, meaningful thing. I was just screwing around to see if I could do it. So I can. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, so what I want to get into is around sales. So mm -hmm. especially from the perspective of, you know, your solo business and getting something off the ground would mean that you were literally not making revenue in the beginning, of course. You spoke, you wrote, you wrote a lot about, you know, making sales to survive. And I even feel that as well when you're looking at, you know, your pipeline and things are running dry or your potential things are coming up that needs renewal. How do you think, like, you should kind of approach things like this? Because people kind of get, you know, they get a bit, there's a lot of urgency and they're trying to make these sales. Is there a, a method you can do to make this kind of repeatable? especially trying to build customer retention and build ongoing services and, and products. Um, should there be some sort of methodology you're sticking by in particular? This is a tough one because there are a couple of things that uh, intersect that make this difficult. Uh, the first is how desperately your business or you need money. And that mm -hmm. leads to short-term thinking. And that's where the difficulty comes in. The long-term sales plan is the one that everybody should focus on, medium to long-term, right? Building uh, a deep pipeline in the right customer with the right product and service and the right timing. That unfortunately always is given way to, I need money now. And when you need money now, and I mean, thinking about your podcast, for as an example, you were monetizing it. It's taken you many, many episodes to build up enough of a podcast to monetize it. If you'd mm -hmm. come out with three podcast episodes and thought, oh, well, screw it, now I'm going to monetize it, you would have the hardest sales effort of your life to get anybody to buy into this. So the mm -hmm. long-term view is do 100 episodes, get to a million downloads, and then profit is easy. Monetizing is easy. So there is this balance that founders always have to play between short-term incentives, short-term money, and medium-term medium incentives and long-term long incentives. And more often than not, the short-term money is the wrong money. The short-term client is the wrong client. So that's often why founders go and raise money so that they can focus on the right client and the right product for the right time. And now we have to start discussing are you bootstrapping or are you raising funding? And if you're bootstrapping, then you have to do the consulting and the freelance work to get the money so that you can sustain yourself while you find the right client. And what this all comes down to is values. What values do your business have? Like what values do you have as a founder? And values, unfortunately, don't pay the bills. But what they do do is provide you with the right framework to get the right customer and the right product or the right service. And this is a very long way of saying you have to think about your sales in short, medium, long term, as well as you have to think about your values in short, medium, long term. Right now, you might need to do some consulting to get the money in so that you can pay your bills and then you can build the right product. But what you need to be thinking about is the long term customer who is the absolute perfect customer for your product or service. Don't mm -hmm. talk to anybody else but that person. Don't try and build anything else but the thing that that person needs. And a good example of this is companies who have dev cap capabilities that end up building websites when they're trying to build a fintech product. And they do that because short term, they need to use the dev resources that are super expensive to get money in to fund the long term build. But what ends up happening is they become a dev house that builds websites and not a fintech company. So you do have to balance this need for the right customer and the right product and short, medium, long-term money. There is unfortunately no easy way. There's no methodology. There's no simple process. You have to figure that out for yourself as a self-aware entrepreneur. Is this client going to divert my roadmap sufficiently that I never get back to it? Or are they going to be an easy one-month client that brings me half a million pounds in revenue that I can then stop doing all the custom work and build the product that I want to build. That's up to you to make those judgment calls. But more likely, it's that you haven't found the right product market fit. So you have to make sure that you've got extra income from somewhere else that isn't core to your product.
I mean, yeah, that's then, not a very clear answer, unfortunately, but no, it, this it, is not a clear answer. <laughs> of course, of course, but it, there's so much complexity there because like the mm. fact that when you're running low on, on money and the capital, that's when you get desperate. You know, you get desperate and you start making those exactly. those decisions. So, you know, for instance, if you took me, for example, you know, I work at a regular day job. So as a result, I don't have, <clears throat> I don't have like I said, those short-term uh, liquidity issues. But again, I have the time issues, you know, and that's a completely exactly. different aspect. Whereas for other people who have just gone, you know, fully boss to the wall, you know, literally cold turkey approach, they're like, okay, we need to make that first sale. I mean, you know, I spoke to a lot of other founders as well, and they're trying to focus on, you know, what gets to the next sale. But it's not mm -hmm. thinking in terms of like what's the most optimal user base or whatever. And that's where yeah. I think sometimes you could end up then, you know, making less money than you could do just with a regular job because. You're taking smaller payments, smaller clients, and then it's not really looking at those bigger opportunities. Um, and I think yep. a really good example of that, I don't know if you're familiar with Graham Brown. He was actually on my podcast before. Great guy this space. He's a UK guy. Yeah, uh, first mover in the world of, of, of you know podcast agencies. And it was very weird when he spoke to me about this. And he was he came onto my podcast because he was a very um, successful entrepreneur, sold a company and traveled for like eight years with his family. Very nice guy. But he was one of the first movers of people that were starting agencies in the world of podcasting. And he was never, ever talking about something that I could work on or, you know, maybe like a small company could work on. It was never the idea. It was always the mm. top tier consulting firms, the top tier brands. And it never made sense to me. And then only in the last couple of months, I've seen him sign contracts with the likes of Ernest and Young, EY. To hold to hold at the produce their end to end podcast, mm. and that's that was the north star he was looking for, and he was always looking out for these opportunities. I'm pretty sure he's, he signed even even bigger deals with um a few other companies in the meantime as well. But I, I was speaking to my girlfriend about it, and I was like, those are, you know, they could be ten thousand a month, eight thousand yep. a month, and he has three people with him, you know. Yep. and I thought that was so interesting to observe. Absolutely. The phrase that pops into my head that my psychologist helped me understand, I have an impatience problem. Uh, I'm, I just try and brute force my way through everything. And my psychologist said to me, uh, waiting is an action. Mm. And that really caught me off guard. And Graham sounds like he had a plan. He waited for that plan to find its market. And uh, Paul Graham, I think I might have even discussed this with you on the last episode. Uh, Paul Graham has got an essay about do not die. The best startups survive and the ones that survive win. That's the game that we're playing, right? Is the short, long, short, medium, long term. And you have to figure out what you need to do in the short term to make your medium term sustainable so you can get to your long term. And that is the juggle that every entrepreneur makes. I mean, the Airbnb story is quite a famous one. They were in Y Combinator, uh, they were down to their last like thousand dollars. And Paul Graham said to them, Why aren't you winning? Like, what is going on? And they said, well, we've got some traction in New York. Let's, let's, we need to do something there. And he said, well, get on a plane, spend your last thousand dollars and go see what's happening. And what was happening in New York is that the one guy who had successfully rented out his Airbnbs was a photographer and he was taking amazing photographs. So they spent their last $300 on a good camera and went around to all the Airbnbs in New York and retook all the photos. And that was it. That was the thing. So patience, waiting might just get you to the point that you need to find that traction. It's all about just putting out the idea that you can wait for these things to happen to you. And it's very difficult when you are a founder and you see a gap in the market and you want to change the world. Sometimes you have to learn to wait as an action. Mm, that's fascinating. That's mm. so crazy. And that, that's a universe theory because like, if he wasn't speaking to that guy at the time, he probably didn't want to go meet him. It was like, probably fuck this. You know, we're probably yeah, we're out, of the way, out the door anyway. If he didn't go to meet him, he wouldn't have flown. And it's just, exactly those things are all interconnected. I think always. Um, Absolutely. It's it's so fascinating. One of the last areas I want to get into, mm. I think is going to be really interesting, is about marketing. So just like we spoke, we, we spoke a lot about it. And it's something that I honestly struggle with, but it's about the fact that mm. I think a lot of people that are in you know incubators and they're trying to launch uh, startups they run into this dilemma because they're always doing you know business plans and, and growth plans things like this and they're working on marketing as well but it's kind of like it's not really efficient or effective these aren't marketers it could be engineers it could be guys that are coming from information systems or or commerce and now they find themselves being that kind of um self-made marketer as well how important for you 
number one to get to get this traction in terms of marketing and actually put that time into it and then secondly then in terms of like efficiency how do you do that because you know you're a very good writer yourself and i see obviously i follow your work very closely but is that part of your your personal brand and and, and then you know as an extension the brand of the business as it grows and scales yeah um it's taken me a long time to pack this away in my head as more important than just about anything else. You can build the best app in the world. And if you can't get it in front of people, it's irrelevant. There are a billion ideas that die because they can't execute on marketing. And marketing doesn't necessarily mean the SEO or the ads, or it means what you need to do to get your product or service in front of your customer. And that last part, I think, is the part that I've become most obsessed with is your customer. Uh, we like to think of business as a zero-sum game, as binary, when it isn't. Business is actually more like golf. You are not playing against your competitors. You're playing against your last score on the course. That's the game. You're trying to get your ball in the hole in the fewest amounts of shots that you are able to hit. That's the deal. We have this problem that we think that if I go out and market, I have to beat everybody at marketing. You don't. You need to get your customers to see your product. And the This ties in very directly to founder's definition of success. If your definition of success is a billion dollars, then you absolutely are competing with everybody because there are only so many dollars that can be spent in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year by so many customers. However, if you are building a million dollar one person business, you do not need to compete with a billion dollar entity. Basecamp is not competing with other product management tools. They're competing to get their customers to spend their money on their product. And that is a very subtle but important difference when it comes to marketing. You don't need to spend a million dollars. You need to spend enough dollars to get your customers to pay you for your product so that you're profitable. That's a whole different game to, I need market domination. You don't need to dominate the market. You're not Uber. You're not trying to play that game. And even Uber, how did market domination do for them now that Bolt is eating their lunch, Lyft is eating their lunch, and everybody else is eating their lunch? This is not a zero-sum game. And that's how I look at marketing. The key thing that I'm trying to understand and help my clients understand is who is your ideal customer? Where do they live? And then go speak to them. That's the deal. That's marketing. Go and speak to your ideal customer where they live and speak to them in a way that they want to be spoken to. The example is if you are a 60-year-old and you're on TikTok, you're not trying to target the 18-year-olds. And if you are, you better hire an 18-year-old because they yeah. speak 18, you don't. So speak to people in the way that you're the most comfortable, right? So uh, the thing that is important for me to remember is communities are built by excluding people, not including them. And that's that's a very important and different way to look at this. We like to think that Facebook got big by building a business that could take a billion people. That's absolutely not the way Facebook did it. Facebook built their entire community by excluding people. So at Harvard, you couldn't get into Facebook unless you had a .edu username. That was exclusion, not inclusion. And they did that for a long time. Think about your business right now. If you're listening to us, who are you excluding by building your business? That's great. Exclude more people. Don't include everybody because if you include everybody in your marketing, you're talking to nobody. And it's the best advice I've ever gotten about my writing, about my podcast, about my tweets, about LinkedIn. Speak to one person, not that's, every person. That's crazy. I, I, love, I love that because it's often like when you get so niche down, you think, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's too specific. Nobody's going to get it. But you'd prefer 10 people to engage with your post and your product than a thousand people who are just vaguely passing through it. And Instagram is a Hold great on. example. Instagram famous just for ass and abs, you know, throw on a photo, whatever, people getting loads of likes. Those likes literally mean nothing. And I don't yeah, even mean from like, a, from like a personal perspective, but if someone is selling something that's in parallel for it, a good example is personal trainers. You know, mm. my background is in, is in fitness and, you know, it's been the last 15 years or, or 10, 10 plus years in this area. But it's interesting the amount of people who have huge followings, who provide loads of content and do all this, but then they're not actually making as much money or yep. any business compared to what their engagement is. Because fundamentally, they're just applying to like the masses. And they're not it's easy to get a like. It's easy to get somebody to like your photo. Will they part with $50? 
if they will not part with $50, they are not your customer. A like, mm. and you said it earlier, getting distracted by the busy work, by getting 5,000 likes on this and that. I mean, my latest LinkedIn post has gone ballistic. It's 450,000 views, 5,600 uh, likes, 300 comments. Not a single person has reached out to me and said, hey, can we hire you to be a coach or a speaking gig? That post, mm. luckily, I spent three minutes writing. It is not a relevant measurement of my success as a creator because nobody paid me as a result of that post. So again, who are you excluding so that you can include the people who will part with money? And I mean, I think I said this in the last episode and it's worth saying again on a bigger scale, you need a thousand people to pay you a hundred dollars a year. And then you as a single founder business, you have got a hundred thousand dollar business. That is amazing. Why would you worry about that? Next year, spend that time getting another thousand users. That's all you need. When you've got a bit, I met a founder at this conference who built a business with 5,000 active paying customers and sold it for a multi million dollar deal. That's all you need 5,000 niche paying customers, and you've got a real business. Forget mm -hmm. about the million. That's not how you build a business. That's Facebook. You don't want to be Facebook. Look at Mark Zuckerberg. You want to be in front of the Congress? No, no, you don't. You want to build your customers who like your product and want to spend money with you. That's the goal of business. It's not to be as big as possible. It's to be profitable and sustainable. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, I think what's really opened my eyes that as well is uh, Andrew uh, Garzecki. Garzecki, I can't remember. Hmm, Garzecki, well. yeah. Yeah, super interesting guy who, who has a you know, startup called yeah. Micro. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And I think mm. just the last couple of months I've been looking at it because the fact that some of those companies are, so for anyone who doesn't know, basically a startup called Micro Acquire that acquires small companies, some of them have like 10,000 in MRR and they're selling for yep. like 500K, 600K. And it's yep. crazy. And I remember I started looking yep. into, looking deeper into like, and I, I'm not like thinking like, oh my God, you want to sell something. But it's like, you kind of do want the end in mind if you're doing something though, just in general, you know? And yeah. I was looking into like, how come, like what are those n numbers when you're selling companies? Like, how does that work? And it's very, very interesting. There's some very general, general things you can throw to the world. If you have some sort of like, a, you know, if you're extracted from the company and you're, and you're able to run it, you know, and e-commerce e is a perfect example because like, those things can be reoccurring. Um, yep. So it's, it's so what I'm trying to say is that it's not like before, if you heard someone sell, sell, a, sell a company when you were younger, you think it would be, you know, huge, huge things and huge deals. And they're, they're huge deals. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not too far fetched for someone, like you said, thousand customers at a hundred quid each to sell a thousand dollar AR yeah. uh, company. Never mind, not too far fetched. The majority of businesses in the world are not billion dollar startups. Of course. I mean, just, just looking at South Africa as an example, it's my home country. It's why I have the numbers at the top of my head. 80% of employment in South Africa comes from small to medium sized businesses. And in South Africa, that is qualified as a business that is less than 50 million rand in turnover, which is only two and a half million pounds. That means that 80% of our country is employing, uh, sorry, that means that all small businesses in South Africa is employing 80% of people. That is two and a half million pound businesses or less. That mm -hmm. every business in the world is a small to medium sized business. And we have glorified this billion dollar exit. It's senseless. It makes It's so painfully frustrating to me that we're aspiring for catastrophic growth instead of consistent, healthy, mentally healthy profit. That's the mm -hmm. game. And here's the other thing that most VC backed, uh, VCs and VC-backed entrepreneurs won't tell you. You will raise more money if you're profitable. You will have better terms if you are profitable. You will very likely not want to raise money if you are profitable. So what should your deal be as a number one entrepreneur? Get profitable. That's the game. And that means even off one person or two person country, a company with 50 people as your employment, who, uh, with 50 customers, who cares? Just get profitable. That's the game. Fantastic. That's a great point to leave it on. I would say a massive thank you, as always. As always. We, just, uh, we could do this again. We can always do this again. There's always so much to do. But uh, hopefully Let's you see what your this. listeners say and then bring me back. <laughs> no, they, they all, to be fair, I will say now that this episode, what the last episode, is definitely in the top five, five or six most downloaded. And I'm up to nearly That's 100. Awesome. I'll get to 100 <laughs> pretty soon. Uh, next That's couple awesome. months. So thanks, Nick.